what I'm thinking about doing, and I haven't looked at it. We can look at it right now. I just uh, might do it on this other lathe over here. I will do it on the hollow spindle. Uh, I'm not sure if this has the same uh, attachment at the back. Yeah, it's identical to the other machine. The dimensions are not the same. Uh, I say the dimensions are not the same because actually while these two are the same brand and reorganized by the same company, the company shut down the factory and opened a new factory. So when they opened up a new factory, the drawings didn't 100% get carried over and I've already found there's things that don't fit from one lathe to another. But at least it's the same design. And what I'm thinking about doing here, I ordered this one without a taper attachment because I had a taper attachment on the other machine and they wanted a lot for the taper attachment. When I bought that machine, it was $1,000 more for the taper attachment. I think it was 6,000 more when I bought this one and I just said, eh, I don't need it. Most of the time we're doing straight stuff here. We got one with a taper attachment, that's, that's okay. I wasn't gonna spend that much for it. But what I'm thinking about doing and that's the other thing too, is how can you move this screw here? You should understand that. And, and most of your lathes that are newer, even if they didn't come with a taper attachment, they're built for the taper attachment like this one is. Older lathes, it's totally different. If you're trying to put a taper attachment on an old lathe, you can have a real problem because you have this support here and you have on the other side of your cross slide, you have your dial mounted. So you don't have a free way to move it. What this machine has and what most of your newer machine has is that dial actually is just a, hooked on to, it's got a bearing out there, but it hooks on to a straight shaft with a key in it. And that straight shaft with a key goes inside of a hollow portion of this one, or it could be the other way around. One, that The piece you're hooked on to could be the hollow point but the key, and there's a keyway, and it just lets you turn this shaft, but it doesn't directly affect the movement of it. So when you're turning it on that dial, you're not directly turning this piece of shaft. You're turning a piece that's either a key or a keyway, and the two drive this shaft, but the movement of it is allowed by the taper attachment when you have the taper attachment. But on old machines, literally, you're turning the lead screw directly if it wasn't meant to come with a taper attachment. So modifying it to take attach a taper attachment can really be a nightmare. They're totally different, everything all the way across on the cross slide. Most of the new ones that are out of Taiwan, out of China, because they didn't want to make 12 different versions, most of them already have the setup for the, uh, and, and your, your newer south bends and stuff would be that way too, I would think. So, um, with this here, what I'm thinking about doing on this machine and definitely planning to do on the hollow spindle when we get it back together. And we've overwhelmed ourselves a little bit, bit with too many home projects, too many, we're gonna do some cleanup around here. And there may be some little videos on some things as we run across them to clean up too that we'd forgotten about. Um, but we're, we're gonna, that has to get done. That project has been too long sitting there collecting dust and it has to get done. But what I want to do, because it will be for cutting tapers, sometimes you even have strange threads that have curves or things in them. So you, have, you can have two threads. It doesn't have to be two thread straight even tapers. I've cut ones where it's a radius. And you do that with a tracer. Um, but what I want to do here and I think I may try and do it on this one too. I don't know if we'll, doing it first would have some advantage, but on the other hand, I want that project done. I don't want it laying there. But what I wanna do is instead of having a taper attachment here, put a second, a little ball screw and a servo motor here that operates off of the uh, scale, that's the lengthwise scale on the lathe so that I can program it for what taper it's gonna cut, radius, if I uh, swear. I have then a manual machine, but where the taper attachment would hook on, I have the capability of having a CNC input 
that will run it in, in part. Now, it's, it's not, you're not taking the total control away. If you have a welded surface you're working on, you can still manually run up to it, but you're going to have a taper that will follow. You're going to have a radius on a shaft that comes in. I can, I can see a lot of uh, advantage to have really both the manual and the CNC together on the same machine. Um, I've got some other machines here that are a CNC teach where essentially you manually run the machine and it wrote, writes a little program to do the same thing that you're manually doing. Um, but you don't get the feel, you don't uh, have the ability to change things on the fly with your actual physical input of turning a dial. Um, I don't know if this will work out as good as what I'm thinking, but uh, that's what I'm thinking anyway, is setting up just a short CNC program for cutting a taper. And the reason where that really makes sense on this one here, um, we've, I don't know if we, have we put anything out about, the, I know we've talked about it on video, I don't know if we put any out on the YouTube at all that we were working on this. No. I don't think we'd Let's actually put it out yet, yeah, but. 11 inch hollow spindle. Um, there's one in town at Skidmore's machine and he does uh, quite a bit of drill work right now and he's pretty good at it. Only reason I really pushed forward to start getting this here is because I needed some, uh, I need some stuff threaded for myself that this is an easier way to do it. And I could go ahead and do it another way but I, I don't feel like doing it. Um, anyway, Sam's got one with a 12 inch uh, in the middle of it, about the same as this lathe. And what I'm looking at doing with this, since we're fussing with it and going through everything, I want to set up the lead screw on it so that the lead screw is ran. I've already got the uh, servo motor for it, but I want to have the lead screw ran so that I can pick out the ratio from the headstock to the lead screw instead of going through the change box. So if I want whatever metric thread module, whatever strange thread I want, I can just pick that out. And that's where I was looking at a limited capability CNC control. Um, there's three of them that I'm looking at. Ah, the one that's in my mind the most right now I'm thinking of is the Acorn. And they make machines for automotive. Centroid, Centroid is the company, the Acorn. Um, it, it should do the job. I've only got two functions I need. One is keeping track of the ratio between the scr two screws. And then I wanna have a lead following with the lengthwise screw being the master. And then the cross slide secondary portion just doing the amount of taper or curve or a radius that we might want to cut at a given place and but you set the master diameter manually with the lathe yet where you want it as you're doing things so makes this a more modernized manual machine is what it would be i wouldn't really call it in any way a c it's cnc aided is what it would be um and we'd see how that works out. We've got quite a bit of, we're not gonna rebuild this machine. The ways are ugly, uh, relatively straight. I don't know why. <laughs> if I was more skilled, I would put a little bit of uh, scraping in there just to hold oil better. We are gonna um, guide some oil, pressurized oil underneath. They were running it with grease in the past and actually this lathe here, this lathe bed was not a hollow spindle originally. This is, I don't know if I mentioned already, it's a layman is the brand. They're, they're out of business, um, built some of the best oil field lathes that ever were built. But most of them you see today are pretty well used up. Um, I had the pleasure of using one in 1980 that was new in 73, but not installed until 79. So it was basically a new lathe and it had a threading attachment on it, which did similar to what I'm talking about with the air. It had an air cylinder, which took the slop out of the, the uh, 
taper attachment. It took all of the, along with taking the slop out as it fed the air cylinder, it also, you'd have a little button. It was a threading attachment. You would push a little button, a little micro switch, and it would engage your threading as your lead screw came around. And then you'd have another micro switch that you manually set. When it would hit that switch, it would kick the threading out. So the air cylinder, instead of just taking up a little bit of slop in things, it was made with an extra, I think it had a quarter or a half inch of uh, slop. You could adjust it, you could tighten it up a little more, but it had a lot of movement in there so that when you came to the end of your thread, it would automatically kick it out. And then you could just run back. And it, it was pretty nice. It, it sped things up. It wasn't by any means a, a computer control. It was all manual, but it worked pretty nice. And I was thinking about this is, this is two lathes put together. Um, I should have just bought another lathe, but I missed my opportunities of the days when these were affordable. I actually had a few days that they were affordable, and I was looking at some, but I kept saying, nah, I got that one that needs a little bit of work that's out back. It would be, you know, I don't have to buy one. Well, yeah, it needs a little bit of work. It needs a lot of work. It would have been much, much cheaper to have just written off what I had already gotten and just bought one. In the meantime, though, those deals are gone. Uh, they're just gone. There are no good deals on this type of a machine. So we push forward. Um, we'll get it together. And uh, yeah, the reason why that one was available for me to run new, and I forget, they paid I think I paid like 150 or 1,000 for it or something. They ended up selling it later on for 25,000 without much use on it, which was a heck of a deal. Um, the reason they were expensive lathes, even the 70s, they were expensive lathes. The reason the company bought it, they bought it because they wanted to get into the drill tooling reworking business. They wanted to get into that, add that on as something that they would do. Uh, in the meantime, they bought the machine. They were so busy, like I get carried away on some projects sometimes. They were so busy, it was during the LAS, the time they were putting in the pipeline. And they were so busy, they didn't have time to put the machine in the shop. So the other shops in town, mostly Sam Skidmore, his, his dad actually, got busy doing the drill tooling and that became a, a really good thing for them. And so the, while well, Fairbanks Machine and Steel had bought a brand new one, they didn't get it put in. They didn't, so they never, they didn't get into doing the work. By the time that they got into doing the work, the work was either done by Sam or it was taken up by Canadian companies and US companies and shipping it back and forth. Um, a few years after we actually had it at the shop there working, there were some people that set up shops in Prudhoe Bay to do the work also. So the work got taken up and in between when they bought the lathe, which was before I was ever at the shop, and they sold the lathe, the ownership of the shop changed. So the people that sold the lathe were not the people that bought the lathe. They were the people that bought the business as a total and when they sold it they didn't really they knew it was valuable but they didn't really know how valuable or where to market it so they had put an ad in the local newspaper a man out of texas somehow had caught it in the local newspaper and he bought it the story as i understand it they had it for sale i think they dropped down to fifty thousand, and i had heard they took 25. i honestly don't know the exact numbers but i heard that he bought it didn't come up here even and resold it to somebody else in texas who paid for the shipping and everything and doubled his money or better um, i think he i had heard that he got ninety-five thousand for it anyway the stuff swaps it trades and that was a beautiful machine i would have liked to have it uh, I wouldn't, any time would I pay 95 for it, no. But I do see ones like it in fair shape going for 80000 today. So, yeah, that's just more money than I need to spend for one. It's not that important to me. Um, 
You can actually buy used CNC hollow spindles way cheaper, but used CNC hollow spindles usually have need to have new controls put on them. And if it wasn't for the shipping, I would have considered that instead of continuing on with this too, just buying a used CNC one and either convert it to manual or use it as a CNC. But this is more a matter of continuing on with something that was a mistake. And then why don't I just have Sam do my, my friend who has another machine shop, have him do my work that I need, which is why I started back into this. He actually encouraged me to get this online and start using it. Um, and the reason was he was too busy when I took the cylinder. I actually took the cylinders over, wanted to pay him to do them. They sat there for a few months and he was too busy, didn't get to them. And finally, I just decided to at least bring them home where I knew where they were. It's been several years now. So I've been without my forklift. I have a nice uh, 30,000 pound forklift that we need to do some cylinder work. I've thought about going back and doing them on the boring mill. We can actually thread internal threads. We can actually do it on the boring mill. Um, but it's cumbersome and I don't want to. Anyway, this, this lathe here needs to get done. We have already, we've put all new bearings in the headstock except for the main spindle bearings. Those two, that was one thing. Had they been bad, I would have just written it off. It's too much money. It, it wouldn't have mattered. Uh, as it was, I think we had close to $5,000 in the other bearings for the headstock. So there's still a fair amount of money in it. We remachined the cross slide. Um, there's a little bit of a problem. We've got a new gib made for it, which is not out of cast iron, and you can argue different things. I've made them out of bronze many times and had good results with that. So whether it's correct or not, I've done it before. I did it again. But uh, there's a little bit of a problem, which we didn't realize until we got a little further along on this, but in the... And that's the next thing we need to ad address. The gib here, it will replace this one. That's the new replacement. And I don't know which way it goes right off, however it goes. Anyway, we'll, you cut a slot in here when you get it at the right slot. And then this allows it to go in and out. The problem is... If you look at this here, the threads are starting to come through. As we recut our taper here, by the time we got clean up, the threads that this screw goes into are coming through. And it's common. For what that thread does, it's okay. It wouldn't be the way they designed it originally. If you look at a taper lock bushing for a shaft, now, a lot of them are called taper lock that are not taper lock. And I think we covered taper locks in another one of our videos uh, a little bit, and we were mostly talking there. The QD is the one I use most of the time, which is not technically a taper lock. The one that is called a taper lock is an old style. It's the first one, and it is specifically taper lock. That is a brand name even. But when you use it, uh, there are screws that hold it together they have a half of a drilled out hole and half of a threaded hole that the screws go into. And the fact that it works on that tells me that it will work on this too. So what I'm gonna do is I will keep as much of the screw thread as I can. And when we figure out where we are here, we'll take a ball nose in mill and we'll make a little bit of a clearance for the thread extension where the thread pops out to right in. Um, and it'll work. Is this going to be a perfect lathe? No, definitely not perfect. It will be functional unless I die before I get it done. And then it probably won't be functional. <laughs> I doubt that anybody else would bother carrying on and making it work. It's kind of a nightmare. Um, going to have variable speed drive for the headstock. We just bought this new surplus uh, 50 horse inverter. I had a used inverter that I had bought before that was a 50 horse, but I felt better about putting a new one on it. So I, it came up at a reasonable price. 
off eBay. And if I knew the seller's name, I'd say, yay, he was good. Because <laughs> uh, he actually shipped it to Alaska for free, like he said he was going to. And very few people do that. Many of them say free shipping everywhere. Uh, some of them even say everywhere, everywhere. Uh huh. Yeah. And then they say, wait a minute, it costs more to go to Alaska. I don't like that. Well, okay. The ones I get annoyed with aren't the ones that I, well, I get annoyed with the, any of them because they should check that out before they say free shipping everywhere. But ones that really, really annoy me are the ones that come back and they say, oh, you're in Alaska. We canceled your order. We won't sell it to you. Just tell me you need another 50 bucks for shipping. Oh, I know. You know, talk to me. We've got drop shippers. We've got methods. You don't have to ship it by overnight UPS for $482. You could put it in the mail for 80 bucks. You know, let's talk about this a little bit. Don't just say, oh no, you're in Alaska. I hate you. Well, we don't hate you back. Really, we don't, but we do get bothered. So anyway, um, the big thing with that, which is I should do a little bit on different things you can do with inverters, uh, since I've been doing some stuff on electrical, pretending like I know stuff. Um, the neat thing that you can do with this, and part of what we did with it, this originally has, I think it was three hydraulic speeds and four mechanical speeds. I know it was 12 speeds total. Oh, I don't have, yeah, I think it's, I think we have three, I mean four, two, two there and two there. Um, anyway, the hydraulic speeds on that are no longer functional and it wasn't worth it to me to fix all of the clutches and hydraulic assembly to make it into hydraulic shift. And that's part of why I wanted the inverter. So I'm using the gear change uh, speeds and then using the inverter to make up for the hydraulics. And part of that, you say, well, you won't have the torque that this originally had. I will. Um, I put it in the lowest of its gears. And then what we will do so that we're not losing horsepower available, we're actually making the motor. Uh, it's a 25, I think it's 25 or 30 horse. Anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to push the motor. And so what you do in pushing it is the motor is going to be wired for 240 volt. We're going to be feeding the inverter, which is a 460 volt inverter. So the 460 volt inverter can put up to 460 volts into the motor when it runs at a higher RPM. And so if it was a native 460 volt motor, it would have the, that was a 50 horse motor. It would have the same wiring as a 230 volt 25 horse motor. And so we're just gonna lie a little bit and we're gonna, that'll be 240 volt. We will program the inverter so that at its normal speed of the motor, it's putting in the 240 volt. And then when we have it at double speed, it will be putting in the 460 volt. And there's a couple ways you can do that. If the inverter doesn't want, isn't, uh, some of them are set up. Schneider was the one, which is a Square D company. That was the first one I saw where they were suggesting to do that, to push your motor, is what they called it. They have a whole little manual that, that uh, Schneider mentions about how to do this with your inverters, with their inverters, the Schneider inverters. Other ones will do it too. You can tell the inverter, this is the native specs for the motor on some of them. You'll tell it that it is a, this one is a, I forget if it's a 900 or 1200 RPM motor. I forget on this. I think it's 1200. But anyway, if it's, say it's a 1200 RPM motor and it is at 60 hertz, you tell it it's 1200 RPM, 60 hertz, 240 and then the inverter control will automatically, when you extend the RPM, the RPM range, bring up the voltage above what the motor originally had. But what you may have to do instead is lie to your inverter. You may have to tell it that the motor it's running is a 2400 RPM 
motor that runs instead of a 1200 tell it that it's a 2400 that runs at 120 cycles at 480 volts i think i said 460 earlier we have 480 here 460 480 somewhat interchangeable old spec was 440 that's a whole nother story 